This morning we are in Mark chapter 10, (coughs) going to be looking at uh, four verses, uh, but they're loaded verses, only because there's been so much discussion about this in the history of the church, and excuse me for drinking water, I still have the residual effects of a cold, don't want to break down coughing, but (coughs) Mark chapter 10, 13 through 16. Let me read this as, uh, as we begin. And they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands upon them. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now again, we've noted before that at this point, Jesus is approaching the last days of his earthly ministry. You see him drawing nearer to Jerusalem where he's going to lay down his life for his people, for for us, if we are believers this morning. But we've also noted that before he leaves, he is giving his disciples some final teaching, which doesn't make this teaching necessarily more important than what he gave before, but it certainly is important. Last week, we heard his instruction on divorce and remarriage. Now, the Pharisees might have uh, meant this to be a snare to Jesus. They wanted to find some reason to accuse him so they could kill him, but... We do need to understand this was providentially arranged by the Lord to give us the instruction that we needed so that we might honor the Lord in our relationships. Again, God uses the evil actions of men to bring about good results. Well, they were trying to ensnare him with this question, but he turns it around to an opportunity to instruct us on how we ought to honor him in our marriages. Now, it's interesting that in the Lord's providence, The next subject that arises deals with the rest of the household. We've already looked at husband and wife and what their relationship is to be like. But what about the children? As Jesus is giving instruction on marriage, some parents come uh, bringing their children to him, uh, seeking to have Jesus lay his hands on them and bless them. Now, it's interesting that the disciples think in this circumstance that the right thing to do is to stop them. You know, don't bother Jesus with with this, whatever it is you're after here, but, you know, leave him alone. But notice Jesus' response. It says, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. Uh, The word means he was angry. And he told the disciples to leave them alone and let them come because the kingdom of God belongs to them to such as them, not just them, but others like them. And he goes on to say that if you don't receive the kingdom of heaven as a child, that you won't enter it at all. Now this morning, we have really two subjects in front of us. One we're going to deal with briefly and the other more extensively. The first one is Jesus, we need to understand what Jesus meant when he said that you must receive the kingdom of heaven as a child if you are to enter it. If you don't become as a child, he says you're not going to enter at all. But secondly, and more extensively, why Jesus laid his hands on these children and blessed them. Now, let me just say at the outset that you know that we're getting precariously close. Actually, we are dealing with verses that uh, deal with the subject of infant baptism. But I don't want to deal with that subject this morning necessarily. I want to set that aside for just a moment and get us to just look at what Jesus was actually saying about these children. Sometimes, you know, the issue of baptism sort of clouds everything, and you know how it is uh, when, if you take, you know, on one side, on one camp, uh, you see anything that even hedges toward the other side, and you just want to dismiss it. That's why I want to put that issue aside and just try to focus on what he's saying here about these children and why he says that. Particularly, of course, we want to understand what the Lord is saying about our own children. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven belongs to these. Is there any sense in which the kingdom belongs to our children? Or is there really no difference in God's eyes between them 
and the children of the world. So those are the things we're going to be looking at this morning. So first of all, let's consider what does it mean? What does Jesus mean when he says, you must receive the kingdom of heaven as a child if you are to enter it. Now, it wasn't that long ago we were looking at another passage where Jesus takes a child and uses him as an example of humility. Whoever humbles himself and becomes like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And yet, in that particular passage, and all the parallel passages, it goes on to say, whoever stumbles, Jesus says, whoever stumbles one of these little ones who believes in me, it would be better that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and he be drowned in the depths of the ocean. One thing we need to note here is that neither in this passage or in any of the parallel passages does Jesus say that these children actually believed. And in Luke's account, he uses a word in the Greek that indicates that some of these children, at least some of them, actually the word he uses that indicates all of them, were actually infants or very young children. So now the question arises, if faith is not in view here, what is Jesus referring to when he says, if you don't receive the kingdom of heaven as a child, you're not going to enter it at all? Well, here he has to mean that to enter into his kingdom, you have to receive the kingdom with a childlike faith and acceptance. I mean, even though our children, and we don't want to misunderstand what our children are like, you know, children when they're very young, especially when they're infants, are very cute, you know, and, and we look at them, we say, oh, how, how cute, how sweet, how innocent, and yet these same children grow up to do some pretty horrific things, don't they? And all of us have had those issues in our own life. We know that we are not innocent and sweet, though we might have been cute at one time, okay? So Jesus is not saying with the innocence and the purity of a child as far as his morality or her morality and so forth, but he's, he is talking about a certain quality that a child has. And that quality typically is the acceptance, just the simple acceptance of whatever you tell that child is true. The child accepts, at least at certain points in their lives, when they're young, not when they're teenagers, but when they're younger, they accept what you have to say uncritically. They accept it as the absolute truth. They trust you. They trust what you're saying. Well, to receive, of course, Christ with a childlike faith, we do have to trust in that one who is revealed in the gospel with this kind of faith. This is the kind of faith that the Spirit of God produces in the soul. The Spirit of God opens the eyes to see God's truth, and he gives you the ability to simply receive it and submit to it uncritically, without reservation, with a childlike faith and humility from the heart. You know, the message of the gospel is really so simple that even a child can understand it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's really quite simple. But as citizens of the 21st century, we have a difficult time with simple things. We always want to question everything. We want you know, we, we object. We always take, it seems like, the side of the skeptic because we are the educated elite after all. But Jesus says you need to become like a child. Simply accept what he has to say at face value and receive him with your whole heart. And don't worry about whether or not you understand everything that there is to understand about the gospel. Don't try to reason out every aspect of it before you accept it. Sometimes people who do that never come to Christ because they never get all their questions answered. And you may never come to Christ if you insist on that. Jesus says you have to receive the gospel with the simplicity of a child. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your trust in him, and he will save you. And if you will simply do that, just putting the objections all aside, I believe the Lord will eventually answer all of your questions and show you exactly how reasonable the Christian faith actually is. Now that's all I wanted to say about that particular point. We need to move on to the second point. And we come secondly to this question. Why did Jesus lay his hands on these children and bless them? Was it because he saw in them an example of faith? You know, the kind of faith that we were just looking at, the kind of faith you have to have in order to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, or was there some other reason? Well, first of all, let's question whether 
their example would be an adequate reason for Jesus to lay his hands on them and to bless them. Now that's why um, I had us read the account of the Syrophoenician woman. Because the Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus <clears throat> and she said, Lord, help my daughter. She's do cruelly demon-possessed. But Jesus didn't help her. He didn't receive her when, he first, when she first came to him. She asked again for this blessing to cast out this demon, but instead of laying hands on the daughter and healing her immediately, he reproved the woman, pointing out that what she was asking for was the bread. It was the bread, of course, he came to bring, and it was the blessings of the kingdom of heaven, but it wasn't for her. It wasn't for her child, but it was for the children of the kingdom, that is, the children of Israel. He says, you know, it's not right to take the children's bread and to give it to the dogs. Jesus was saying that she was the dog, and her daughter was a dog, but the Israelites were the children of the kingdom. But of course, that all changed when she showed herself to have saving faith, a faith that looked to Jesus Christ as the Messiah, that refused to let him go until he granted her and her child that bread. That's when Jesus healed the child. But I want you to notice that that was not the case with the children that these parents were bringing to Jesus Christ. When they brought their children, he immediately wanted to receive them. When the disciples tried to stop the parents, Jesus actually got angry at them and said, stop, you know, let them come. And then he laid his hands on them and he blessed them. Now, why did he do this for them? but he didn't do it for the Syrophoenician daughter. And the question I'm asking now is this, was it simply because he saw in these children an example of faith, but when he looked at the Syrophoenician woman's daughter, she couldn't produce the same kind of example of a childlike faith? She didn't have it? it? Seemed to be something that Jesus was saying was really true of all children. So is that why Jesus didn't give her the blessing initially, but he did give it to these children because they had this example and her daughter didn't. Well, if Jesus blessed these children because they were an example of childlike faith, then why didn't he do it when he saw, I should say to others, when he saw them doing things that may have also expressed certain virtues that are found in saving faith? And this may seem like a, ridic a ridiculous example, but I don't think it is. When he saw the Pharisees keeping the law of God, which is what he wants us to do, he didn't lay his hands on them and bless them because they were doing something they should have been doing. Instead, he curses them in Matthew 23 because they were hypocrites. So what I'm saying is this. The outward display of some virtue that doesn't come from a gracious heart is really not a sufficient grounds for the Lord to lay hands on someone and to bless them regardless of whether they're young or old. He doesn't lay his hands and bless people for examples they give if those examples really don't come from a gracious heart. Why did Jesus lay his hands on these children and why did he bless them? Well, Jesus actually tells us in verse 14. He says, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. You know the word for means because. The reason why he wanted them to come and didn't want the disciples to hinder them is because the kingdom of heaven belonged to them. It's because they were the heirs of his kingdom. Somehow, the kingdom of heaven belonged to them, even though there's no reference in this passage or in any of the parallel passages of the fact that they had faith. Now, we need to come to grips with this because that raises some pretty interesting questions. First of all, what was the kingdom that Jesus was referring to here? Was he talking about the old covenant kingdom of Israel, the typological kingdom of Palestine, the picture of the reality, the, that, that kingdom, that picture belonged to them, so I'm going to lay my hands on them and bless them? Or was he talking about the reality behind the pictures, the kingdom of heaven? Well, first of all, what was Jesus preaching all during this time? When he was referring to the kingdom of God, was he referring to the picture or was he referring to the reality? 
when he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven, which is the same as the kingdom of God, is at hand, was he saying that the, the, the picture of Palestine was here? Or was he saying that the genuine kingdom was here? Well, I think Jesus is talking about exactly the same thing he was talking about throughout his ministry. He was talking about the kingdom of God, the only kingdom that he came to preach. Now, to whom did Jesus say the kingdom belonged? Was he saying that it belonged to them? Now, here's another question that rises because Jesus says the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So was Jesus saying the kingdom belongs to these children? Or is he saying it was, it was children like these children, but not these children? Or people who exhibited sort of a, you know, a childlike faith like these children, but not these children? Well, we do have to ask the question, on whom did Jesus lay his hands? And whom did he bless? Was it these children? Or was it those who had a faith like these children, only genuine faith in their case? Well, we know from the text, Jesus laid his hands on these children, and he blessed them. So Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, belonged to them, but not just to them, but also to those who were like them. That's the reason why he says such as these, not just these, but those who are also like these. Now here's the important question. Is Jesus saying that these children were actually in the kingdom? Was he saying that they were saved? Well, you know as well as I do that you have to have faith to enter into the kingdom of heaven, that is the redemptive kingdom of heaven. Was Jesus saying that all these children, including the infants, had faith? Well, I don't think that's what he's saying because there is another sense in which the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, can belong to these children and yet for them not actually to be in the kingdom of heaven, and that is by way of promise. It can belong to them in the same sense that it belonged to the Jews. By the way, the kingdom of God, the reality belong to the Jewish race by way of promise. It actually was promised to them. And even when the vast majority of them were unconverted and were actually enemies of Christ, it still belonged to them until it was taken away, of course. It belonged to them. It belonged to them because of their connection with Abraham. The Lord promised to give that kingdom to Abraham and to his children. And the reason why he did is because Abraham believed and God became a God to him and to his children. All of the blessings of the new covenant, not just the old covenant, but the new covenant were promised to the Jews. That included the Messiah. That included the salvation Messiah was bringing. That included the kingdom that he was bringing. Paul writes in Romans regarding what it, what it was the advantage of being a Jew in Romans 9, verses 3 through 5. Listen to what he says. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, now note, to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service, so far we can say everything seems to be Old Testament. But then he says, and the promises. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ? According to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever, or actually, more literally, the blessed God, that is Jesus Christ. So notice that the promises belonged to the Jews. That's the reason why Paul was grieving over the fact that they had rejected Christ because he was the one who was going to give them all those promises. He was the one who was actually the promised Messiah, and he was for them. Now, again, why do you think it was that when Jesus came into the world, that he wasn't born in, in Russia or Gog and Magog or whatever the nations were at that time, but he was sent to Israel? He was born into the Jewish race. It's because that he was the fulfillment of the promises made to them. Why was his ministry exclusively to Israel? Why did he say, when somebody asked him regarding you know, some Gentile 
wanted some help, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You ever ask yourself that question? It's because he was the fulfillment of the promises made to Israel. Why did Peter tell the Jews on the day of Pentecost the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is one of the promises made in the new covenant to the Jewish race, why did he say it belonged to them and to their children? Why did he use that terminology? Well, because the promises belonged to them and to their children. They were all the promised seed of Abraham. I hope I don't have to read that passage. I think you're pretty familiar with it. He just says this, Repent to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Now, the reason why Peter said that was because they were the heirs of the blessing. They and their children were the children of Abraham. The promises were made to him and to his seed. Now, why did he also say that the promise also applied to those who were far off? To as many as the Lord our God would call to himself. Well, it's because the Lord was now extending the kingdom of heaven to the Gentiles. That every Gentile who would repent and believe would receive the same blessings that the Israelites received, just as the Syrophoenician woman did when she believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. She received that bread. When Paul went on his missionary journeys, why do you think he went first to the Jews? It's because the promise was made to the Jews first. And then when they would reject Jesus Christ, he would turn to the Gentiles. So in what sense does the kingdom of heaven belong to these children? That's the question we're, we're answering right now. It belonged to them by way of promise because they were children of Abraham. The one who believed, the one with whom the Lord made his covenant. Actually, I don't think there's any, maybe any reasonable question on that particular, that particular issue. I think it's quite plain that that's the only sense in which it could belong to them unless they, in fact, believed. If they believe, then they actually possess it. They actually enter into it. You can't enter into it without faith. But in some sense, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them, and I think it's this sense that it was promised to them. They were the heirs of the kingdom. Now, we should note at this point that the kingdom no longer belongs to the Jews, does it? Because the Lord took it away. When they rejected his son, when they crucified his son, and he gave it to another nation that will produce its fruits, it now belongs to everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ and, will, and those who will do the work of his kingdom Actually, we're going to see something more about that this evening. It belongs to Jews and Gentiles who have believed. It belongs to the church. It belongs to us if we have trusted in Jesus Christ. We possess God's kingdom. We possess the promises of God. The same promises that God made to the Jews. Because we, in fact, when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, become the children of Abraham. You know, we are, you might say, true Jews. We become like Abraham the believer. We don't become a part of the Jewish race. We don't become Jews by nationality. You know, our, our ethnicity doesn't change. Our DNA doesn't alter. But we become the spiritual seed of Abraham because we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham believed. It was counted to him as righteousness. If we believe, then the Lord reckons it to us as righteousness as well. But now here is the question that we need to look at a little bit more carefully. <clears throat> what about our children? Okay, what about the children of our children, uh, now that we possess the kingdom, now that we are children of Abraham, does God, is he still dealing with our children? Here's the question we need to ask. Does the Lord have anything to do with them? Or did he only extend these mercies to the children of the faithful before the new covenant but not in the new covenant. If we brought our children to Jesus, would Jesus lay his hands on them and say, of such is the kingdom of heaven, or would he tell us, as he told the Syrophoenician woman, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs? Well, after the Syrophoenician woman exercised faith, Jesus gave her the bread. He gave her the children's bread, 
And he gave it not just to her, but he gave it to her daughter. Bread that was meant for the children of Abraham. He cast the demon out of her daughter. He set her free. And that was a blessing of the new covenant. It wasn't a blessing of the old covenant. It's not like the Syrophoenician woman became a part of the old covenant. She became a part of the new covenant, the covenant that Jesus came to bring, because the new covenant is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, so that the blessing that the girl received, this bread that was for the children, was the blessing of Abraham. And it was nothing less than a blessing that came from the new covenant, the covenant that Jesus was ministering, that which was the fulfillment, as I mentioned, of the Abrahamic. Now, having believed like Abraham believed, and as the Syrophoenician woman believed, that is us, would the Lord lay his hands on our children and say, of such is the kingdom of heaven. Are they the heirs of his blessings in pretty much the same way as these Jewish children were by way of promise? Now, we might diverge on this point somewhat as far as how we would answer this question between, again, Pater Baptists and Baptists. But the idea or the, the belief that they are appears to be consistent with what we see regarding children in the rest of the New Testament and not just with the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter. I think it's consistent with what Paul says regarding the, ch the children of at least one believing parent and, and realizing that there's a variety of interpretations of this passage. Let me just tell you what I think is being said here. Paul says that they are holy. The children are holy. It doesn't mean that they're saved. Some people press that point to say that, you know, these children are actually converted or that they're guaranteed to be saved or if they died at that moment, they were going to enter into heaven. There's a lot of weight that's placed on that word holy, but I don't think that that's what Paul's actually saying. I do believe that what he means is this, that the Lord in the new covenant graciously removes that polluting influence of the unbelieving parent so that the child or the children are not affected by his uncleanness or hers, depending on the case, but that they yet possess this promise of the kingdom through the believing parent. And the reason I say that is this, because I think Paul is addressing, again in the Lord's providence, something that happened in the old covenant that uh, does not happen in the new. In the old covenant, if there were a person who was in Israel who married a Gentile, that if that person repented of that sin of marrying that Gentile, they would actually have to send that person away. They would have to send the Gentile away and they would have to send the children away from that union. We see that happening in the books of, of Ezra and Nehemiah, that that's the people that intermixed with, with, uh, Gentile, with the Gentile nations and they had marry those whom they should not marry. Now, in a case like that, as I've said, both spouse and children had to be sent away. But in the new covenant, that's no longer the case. If the unbelieving spouse wants to remain, he or she may remain. But if they want out, the believing spouse must let the unbeliever leave. But either way, Paul says, the children of that union are holy. They don't have to go out with the unbeliever. Now, is Paul mean to say here, because this is basically the other interpretation, is Paul merely intending to say here that the children are legitimate children rather than illegitimate? Is he saying that, uh, well, this, is, this marriage shouldn't take place? I mean, here's the question. The marriage shouldn't take place. You're not really legitimately married to this person, so your children are illegitimate. And what Paul is saying is that, no, it really is a legitimate union and these children really are legitimate. See, if that's what Paul wanted to say, he, he really had the language available to him to say it. Uh, he could have used the language of the author to the Hebrews when he speaks about God's discipline in Hebrews 12.8. But if you are without discipline of which all had become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. You see, there is a word in the Greek that refers to those children who we would use the term, or maybe we don't use the term because it's used too much today for other purposes, but, but bastard is the term that used to be used. Not a legitimate child, not, you know, a, a my offspring, or at least a legitimate offspring. That's what Paul, or excuse me, the author to the Hebrews is saying, 
if you don't receive the discipline of God, then you are an illegitimate child. You might be claiming to be in the household of God and a Christian, but you really are not. You're illegitimate. You're a, a bastard. But that's not the word that Paul uses here. He could have used that word, but he uses holy, he uses sanctified, he uses clean, unclean. All these terms really have another meaning. It really talks about their relationship to God because holy only has reference to God. It doesn't have reference to anything else. It has to do with, with that object or that person's relationship to God. It's really, I think, speaking about whether or not God will have anything to do with this child, a child of an unbeliever and a believer. In the New Covenant, the Lord is saying that He will. Now, if the Lord did not remove the polluting influence of the unbelieving spouse, the child would be unclean, Paul says, but now they are holy. And I think it simply means holy in the sense that they're set apart to God, that God owns them, that God's going to deal with them. He's going to deal with them directly. He's going to deal with them indirectly. I think it means that these promises of the kingdom belong to our children in the same way that the kingdom belonged to these Israelites who brought their children to Jesus and in the way the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. It belonged to her and the benefits belonged to her as they were given to her. You've got to realize that when a benefit is given to somebody like that, it, it is a benefit of the kingdom of heaven again, of that new covenant. Now, the fact that, our, that, that the kingdom of heaven belongs to our children, or at least that, that God is dealing with them differently, is, I think, further consistent with the instruction that we saw in Ephesians 6, 4, when the Lord gives instruction both to parents and to children. He says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but raise them in the fear or the, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And I think it explains why he addresses children directly. And he tells them, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. And why he also goes on to say that the blessing that was attached to the keeping of that commandment in the Old Covenant pertains to the children who will keep that commandment in the new covenant in verse 3, so it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Now, it doesn't appear to me that Paul here is singling out a select group of children in, in the church who have believed. He's addressing all the children of believing parents, as would be done in the old covenant. Exodus 20, verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. That's what Paul is quoting there in Ephesians chapter uh, 6. And he's also addressing the parents of these children to do for them what he commanded the parents to do for their children in the Old Covenant. This is the passage that I didn't read, Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Now, it seems to me that if Paul had intended to address only the believing children and parents who had believing children, then he would have given instruction, I think additional instruction, to those parents who had unbelieving children to tell them what they ought to be doing with their kids. Uh, and yet, he doesn't, and I, I don't think any of us would assume that there were no unbelieving children in that congregation. It certainly hasn't been the case in any congregation I've ever been in. So again, the question is this. Would the Lord lay his hands on our children, as he did the Israelite children, and say, to such belongs the kingdom of God? I think the indications are that he would from the Syrophoenician woman, the example there, and from, of course, what, what is already said with regard to um, uh, the commandments given to, um, you know, to the parents and to the children, and also with regard to what Paul says is the status of the child of either two believing parents or with one believing parent, and that is that the children are holy. And I should mention as well that, that if that is the case, that's certainly consistent with the way that God has always dealt with his people throughout the entire Bible, even prior to the new covenant or 
prior to the Old Covenant even. I mean, did the Lord's dealings with Adam affect only Adam, or did they also include his household? I think in his case, we all have to agree. What he did affected us tremendously. What about Noah? He was the only righteous man, and yet, when it came time for the flood, the Lord saved him and his household from the flood. When he called Abraham out, he made a covenant with Abraham and with his children. And by the way, that is the basis upon which the new covenant is given to us. Same thing with Isaac, same thing with Jacob, same thing with Jacob's children. The line of David, this line of kings, all came from a covenant made with David. Any Gentile that joined himself with Israel in the history of the old covenant basically brought the whole family in. This is what the Lord has basically always done. And I believe it's also what he said he was going to do in the Old Covenant. Uh, as he was looking forward to the New Covenant, th there were a number of verses I could use, but I chose this particular one. Jeremiah 32, verses 37 through 41. And notice that he is addressing the Jews, but he's definitely looking forward to a time that is speaking about the New Covenant. This is what he says. Behold, I will gather them out of all the lands to which I have driven them in my anger, in my wrath and in great indignation. And I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. They shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always. Now notice, this has got to be referring to the new covenant. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. I will rejoice over them to do them good and will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. I want you to notice again in these new covenant dealings, the Lord doesn't limit it just to them. He says this is for your good and it's for the good of your children as well. The fact is that we are not disconnected from our families. There's, there's really no way that we can be, unless, of course, one of the family members makes a sharp division, which can happen as well. But we are related to one another in our families, in a household, whether for blessing or for curse. Throughout the Old Testament, if, if a family, if there was a, you know, a faithful, righteous head, the family was spared from judgment. If there was a wicked head, the whole family went down in judgment. That happened not only in Israel, but outside of Israel. It applied to people in the covenant and outside the covenant. That's just the way that God deals with people. He uh, deals with households. So again, the question, to whom does the kingdom belong? Well, obviously, it belongs to those who enter the kingdom by faith. But I believe it also pertains to the children by way of promise. Now, here's another interesting question. If that is the case, does that mean your children are saved? Does it mean they're automatically going to be saved sometime in the future? Well, no, it doesn't, because even those children that were in the covenant in the, at any time in the history of the world, there was never a case that I can think of where all of them actually were saved. Although we would like all of our kids to be saved. I'm not saying it can't happen, of course, because people have had their whole household saved. But the examples we have doesn't bear that out. It doesn't mean they're automatically going to be saved, but it does mean that God has set your children apart to himself. That in some way he does deal with them because of you, not just through you, but also more directly. And, and I just want to answer the question of how he could do that, or well, what does this mean? What, what am I actually saying here? Well, first, it means that when the Lord blesses you as believers with the blessings of the new covenant, that he blesses you not just with reference to you, but also with reference to your children. That when God gives you the strength to live a godly life, it's not only that you might glorify him, but it's because he wants your children to have a godly influence in that house. He wants you to be a saving influence on those children. When he reveals his word to you, it's not just so that you will be edified, but it's so that you will be able to teach your children and instruct them in the ways of the Lord. I mean, isn't that what Paul said in Ephesians 6 that you must do? And when he provides for you, 
He does it not just to provide for you, but also for your household, for your children, which are his children. Again, the, the term that's often borrowed from the Old Testament to describe this is, I will be a God to you and to your seed. And when he commands you to discipline your children and for your children to obey you, he's not saying that just so you can have a pleasant household, you know, where the kids aren't running amok, but he's saying it because he wants his children to live and conduct themselves in a godly way. I think you would admit that there's a huge difference between the children raised in the church, or at least raised by uh, Christians in a godly household, and those that are raised in ungodly and ignorant households. I think we've just seen the example of what can happen of a child raised in an ungodly household. Sometimes they grab guns and go shooting, right? Now, those raised in Christian homes are blessed with many sanctifying influences, including the gospel, which I believe the Lord intends to use to save these children. I think if you were to do a survey of church history, and I'm talking about the church history after the, you know, the inspired history ends, you would find that most of those men and women that the Lord used powerfully in the history of the church were actually raised in Christian households. They had at least one godly parent, if not two. Jesus says, permit the children to come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. If they believe, they're in the kingdom. If they don't believe, it still pertains to them by way of promise. So in closing, let me just ask this question. What does this passage call you to do? Well, first of all, it calls you who are parents to recognize that God is dealing, not just with you, but also with your children in his mercy, that they belong to him. And because they do, God wants you to raise them in a particular way. He wants you to discipline them. By the way, discipline doesn't, you know, when I say that word, you probably think of this, you know. That, that's not the only thing the word means. Certainly, we need to not spare the rod. But it means to instruct them in godly living. It means to train your children. And, of course, instruction has to do with verbal instruction, but discipline can mean that as well. The Lord wants you to teach your children. He wants you to discipline your children. He wants you to pray for your children. He wants you to model Christ before your children. He doesn't want you to assume that your children are saved, but he wants you to evangelize your children. He wants you to bring them to worship. All these things so that they might come to know him and enter into his kingdom through his son. I should make a note here, too, that it's interesting that no matter what position Christians take on this particular issue with regard to the children, virtually all parents of, of uh, believing parents raise their children in precisely this way. And I think this can't be anything less than the Lord simply ensuring that these children be raised properly. I mean, how could we do otherwise as parents? We can't. We have to raise them this way. We want them to know the Lord because they're going to be lost if they don't trust him and believe. They're not automatically in the kingdom. But secondly, it does remind you children who are here okay, that the Lord has given you all these blessings for a particular reason, and that reason is that you might know the Lord. If you haven't trusted him yet, or if you have trusted him but haven't professed him, you need to do that. You need to own the Lord. You need to confess him before others, before he's going to confess you before the Father. Now, if you don't want to trust him, you have to remember that all these advantages that the Lord has given to you, if you have all these things and you don't come to the Lord, things are going to be much worse for you on the, on the day of judgment. They're not going to be better. They're going to be worse. These blessings will turn into a curse on that day because they will all speak against you. When Jesus taught and preached in, the, in Capernaum and they rejected what he had to say, he said it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for Capernaum because they saw his miracles, they heard his teaching, they had all these advantages and they rejected him. What will the Lord do to you if you know all these things and have received all these things and yet you do not come to Christ. Christ. 
Well, the fact is, it's going to be far worse for you on the day of judgment than for Sodom and Gomorrah. Actually, much worse probably than for Capernaum. So don't let the things which God intends to you as a blessing become a curse for you, but rather let them draw you to Jesus, that you might trust in the Lord, that you might turn from your sins, that you might be saved. Well, may the Lord take and apply his word to us. I hope, I hope all that got through. It was quite a lengthy sermon, but I wanted to lay it all out before you in one package rather than trying to divide it up. It will be online if you want to uh, look at it later. But for now, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and apply. As we've examined these things, as we've considered whether they're biblical or not, let's just ask the Lord to take them and apply them to us as we see them in the Word of God.